each other and all anybody heard was static. Normally I'm just fine. I just radio from one ship to another. I don't know what happened that day. And uh, scientists knew what happened on that day. And a lot of regulation passed. It takes a disaster a lot of times for change. Here it is. <clears throat> yeah, we'll talk about MIMO antennas today. MIMO stands for, do you remember? Extra credit, extra points. I'll give you a dollar. I was looking for motivations here. MIMO, MIMO. Multiple input, multiple output. We got on the call. Oh my gosh, thank you. Glad you're not here, that would have been a hug. <laughs> He's dead much. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> he loves hugs. <laughs> and who said that? I'm not switching to people. Yet. Is this Devin? Oh, Devin, yeah. I guessed it, see? <laughs> awesome. Yeah, multiple input, multiple output. Instead of one whip antenna, or one halo, or some Yagi antenna, I'm going to have a bunch of them. And uh, like everything else, I have this tiny little story, sorry. I wanted a equivalent of a Wi-Fi radio to talk to an airplane that was moving at me. And the airplane's like, it's pretty fast. I mean, it's just a propeller Cessna kind of thing, but still, you know, 150 miles an hour. And so I wanted to detect it long ways away and send it long, long messages. And when it flew by, I keep wanting to talk. I kept wanting to talk to it and talk to it and talk to it and talk to it. And I found I needed a high gain antenna, like a Yagi. And it gave me this nice antenna pattern. I pointed at the plane. And when it flew over me, it was flying over one of those nulls. And the Yagi antenna, when it flew behind me, I lost him right away. OK, I need two Yagi antennas, one pointing this way and one pointing that way. That'll help. And then divide that signal. And uh, the problem with dividing the signal is I lose 6 dB on a splitter right away. So instead of me, me being able to talk to it 20 kilometers away, I lost 6 dB. So I can only talk to it 5 kilometers away. But I can talk to it 5 kilometers that way. That's still not what I want. I want 20 and 20, OK? So I put a time domain switch on there. Full gain of the antenna, full gain of that antenna, full gain of this antenna. And I actually made it have a decision. Which antenna does it see the plane louder at? This one I see the plane quietly. This one I see the plane louder. All right, use this one, but keep checking every once in a while. I just need a millisecond every 10 seconds. Keep checking, keep checking. When the plane's behind me, this became the right answer. But keep checking, keep checking. So that was a way to add multiple antennas, multiple in multiple out. And that's quite the exaggeration. I'm going in front of me and behind me. But what about just somebody moving inside of a room? Like where it's 60 gigahertz. It's very directional antenna. I need to be able to turn on and off different antennas or change the phase across different antennas to follow that user. And I do it by trial and error. That's how keyboards work. They're always looking for a button to be depressed. It's like, Anybody press me now? How about now? How about now? It just does that all day. What a job. And when I finally press down the letter H, it's like, oh, we got one. It's an H. Write that down. <laughs> so antennas are like that. Can I see the user? Can I see the user? Can I see the user? Oh, I got it. I got it. He's right here. OK, antennas around me, help me out. Give him a better beam. Antennas around them, help me out. Give him a better beam. It's just like a keyboard. Scanning. And Anyway, that was my little analogy. Right there. All right. So, oh yeah, one more CDMA thing. I was um, doing a mediocre job talking about how CDMA. And I'm going to draw something on the board real quick. Uh, is a stacking of users. Um, in, in the bandwidth that we're allowed to use from here to here, one user's data is coded to that user, and stacked on top of it is another squiggly rectangle, U1, U2, I'll just do one more, U3. <clears throat> All their data is mixed inside that rectangle of 
complex waveform. And the only way you can extract your information is by convolving it with the right pseudo-random code specific to your device. Now you can pull that data for that user only if you beat against it. Convolving is beating against exclusive OR in the example I put in the announcements. Your pseudo-random code, you can pull out your data. And on paper, the guy who invented this says, this is amazing. We could go from U1, U2 to U infinity. We could stack as many users as we have codes. It's like 10 to the 30th length of code. We could have 10 to the 30th users. There's never been that many life forms born on the planet. We've solved, we cured cancer here, right? But no, it turns out, it falls apart immediately, is if one of these users is really close. So U1 and U2 are 100 yards away. I'm sorry, U1 and U3 are just 100 yards away, so they're the same, the same signal level. Their rectangle is the same height. But U2 walks, climbs over the fence of the base station and is holding onto the tower for some reason. I don't know, this guy's crazy. But um, if, his, if a user is, has a dominant signal that overpowers all the others, the complete coding scheme falls apart. I have blinded the receiver. Sometimes, in, especially in radio astronomy, we talk about the received signal in terms of brightness, how bright it is. Kind of makes sense when you're looking at a, through a telescope, that's where that word comes from. But I like to think of blindedness. So I wish I had a distinctly different color. But U2 is going to be so loud in the power level it would dominate the other users. So even if your PN sequence is 10 to the 30, you're only going to be able to decode U2. He drowns everybody else out. You only get a certain signal-noise ratio, but you also only get a certain dynamic range inside of a system. And when we talk about SDRs, I'll talk more about dynamic range, but he's exceeded it. <laughs> it's too loud. I can't discriminate the other users that are buried down much quieter. So, and I don't know if that shows up on the camera, but I was just showing a much louder user. So in CDMA parlance and communication par parlance, this is called intuitively the near-far problem. If one guy is near, if one transmitter is near, I can't hear the far. So by that rationale, we need what's called perfect power control, and then we're fine. It's very expensive, it's very hard to do, especially in a mobile environment. So the, it solves everything, we can stack infinite users, but it breaks apart in reality. So many of my stories from now on will be like that. Here's how we solve that, and here's where it falls apart. <laughs> so, and 5G is like, let's just do all of it. So that's the beauty of it. We'll do close to perfect power control. We'll do every modulation known to man. We'll change to goofier orders of modulation the farther away you get, where your signal noise ratio is compromised. And uh, so that was the sort of the point. And some of you got different answers, which is fine and interesting. In your lab one, if your cell phone was in here versus your cell phone being outside, as long as it didn't change frequency, which a lot of yours did, which is also super interesting. So one, so two. <clears throat> so when you were inside, that's L1 condition, your cell phones had to yell a lot louder. The power was a lot higher for many of you. Um, and when you went outside, as long as you stayed on the same frequency and other things were constant, it went down about 15 dB for a lot of you guys. So what you just did is you did L2 minus L1 equals 15. That's, that's what you did in the lab. And you weren't measuring the received power from the base station. That would have been cool and given you the right answer because our spectrum analyzers can't see base stations very well. The noise floor in them and the spectrum analyzers are poor. So I was doing the opposite. I said, well, how loud did your cell phone have to transmit? That's a function of path loss as well, because this base station up here 
it has a PR of some setting, something like negative 90 dBm. I want to receive every cell phone that's attached to me at negative 90 dBm. That's power control. And that fixes the near far problem. And it's like plus or minus 6 dB. That's pretty good. Not really. I'll pay you my $1,000 rent, plus or minus times four divided by four, is that okay? Plus or minus 6 dB. A lot of fields like that. Electromagnetic fields too. <laughs> so what you did, um, you looked at the, a couple of you had the spectrum analyzer pegged, you couldn't even see the top of the signal. And don't worry, that it'll protect itself. But you're kind of overloading. It's, it's smart enough to deal with that. But I saw things like negative 20, and negative 45, or whatever, numbers like that. And that's, that's the difference in the path of losses, believe it or not, even though it's a transmitting tower. So yeah, I'm enjoying reading your lab write-ups. So, good stuff. So yeah, that's how we're getting one by one into how these modern communication systems work. <clears throat> so stop filming my belt up. Let me open up today's slides. Any questions on that? Power control, does it make sense? I want to receive everybody at the same level, so I'll tell you what to transmit. I'll give you all these numbers. This is like time domain elements when we talk about LTE and 5G. I'm not diving into that right now. But I just wanted to tell you that part of the symbols that you send, some of them are data bits. We like to talk about those a lot. Some of them are symbols like, do you have an account with us with Verizon in good standing? They go to your home subscriber where you bought the phone. When I was bought in Massachusetts, it has to go there every time I make a phone call. It's crazy. Um, but uh, there's also little time slots, it's just supposed to say, for beam sweeping is what that says. Yeah. <laughs> so some symbols tell which antenna to use at this base station to talk to which user. And I'm going to sweep across different antenna elements, it's called. And you're going to come back with some bits that say, I really like this green antenna and this yellow antenna. Please just use those for me. And uh, you really want. <laughs> need to get your data across. So multiple input, multiple output. The base station receives stuff from your smartphone and it transmits stuff to your cell phone. Multiple in, multiple out. Are those the uh, SMS messages being sent? Um, SMS, I was just asked about. Uh, older cell phone plans or if you don't have an iPhone, <laughs> that changes everything. Um, there's always a control channel signal linked to the phone. Control channel is where you set those power controls numbers. I need you to transmit quieter outside, louder inside. Um, control signal, control, control, control. And somebody figured out we could put low data rate messages on there. And for free, and we'll charge everybody 10 cents a message on the back end, back when we uh, figured it out. That was pretty good. I've had hundreds of dollars. Anyway, <laughs> bills in my lifetime. Now they're free, and um, Apple uses iMessage, which is not along the control channel. It's just data. And you always have that one friend with an Android where it sends to them SMS, and everybody else gets um, complaining. So we'll talk more about. Uh, MIMO and other diversity things, like two antennas pointing in a way. First, multiplexing, to understand just the concept of it. The concept of multiplexing. Uh, so, 
In a keyboard, you have a wire for every key, right? Coming out of there? No, it's one wire, and it scans across it. <laughs> um, it's looking for, otherwise, without multiplexing and scanning and looking for stuff, you need a wire for every switch, a wire for every button, a wire for every. Uh, the steering wheel is a great idea, a great um, use of multiplexing. I'm just giving you the concept of multiplexing, not necessarily communications, but um, it took decades and decades for car manufacturers to put all those buttons inside a steering wheel because it's really hard to put six 18 gauge wires down something that spins and spins and spins. But what, what is easy is a copper commutator and a circle that's copper. So when you spin the steering wheel, that wire, that conductive connection stays as you spin the steering wheel. So I can send one or two wires down a steering column. So with one or two wires, I need all these volume up, volume down, cruise control, stuff like that, all to go down those two wires. So how do I do that? I multiplex. The volume up button is time one, the volume down button is time two, the cruise control button is time, time three, and it just sweeps through those in time, waiting for those buttons to be pressed. It's just sweeping and sweeping and sweeping. Anyway, so a transmission medium, I can only run two wires out of a steering wheel. That's my medium. A transmission medium, I can only afford to buy 15 megahertz of bandwidth on AT&T in this band. That's my transmission medium. Um, it's easy for me to exceed capacity, one, many buttons, more than two, uh, to transmit a signal. So multiplexing can carry multiple signals on one medium. The CDMA bandwidth I was showing you, it's users, as many as I can fit in there, in one bandwidth. That was multiplexing. <clears throat> Pretty, pretty simple, cruise control, volume, channel, change, and uh, that goes to the radio, that goes to the cruise control, that goes to the, and there's our steering. So in, more specifically to communications, it's cost per megabits per second. Um, how do we do that in a cost-effective manner? I can't keep buying chunks of 15 megahertz. I need to stack users somehow. And uh, yeah, it's cheaper. And uh, it's like, there's a hit. If we're all sharing, if there's 10 users sharing a tenth of a second each, it's a, um, it's a hit of use. But what's more expensive, time or frequency? So, back to communications, multiplexing techniques, we can divide it up in the frequency domain. That's how the early cell phone was. Everybody gets 30 kilohertz. F1, F2, F3, F4, 30 kilohertz. Very basic. And then voice stream came along with their IS-136 cell phone standard, and everybody gets a third of a second on F1, F2, F3. So you get F1 time one, F1 time two, F1 time three, F2 time one, F2 time two, F2 time three. I'm sorry, let me just show you a picture. <laughs> so we each get 30 kilohertz channels back in the day, or shoot, I want all the channels, but every third of a second, every third of a millisecond, every whatever. And FYI, to do frequency division, you need some sort of frequency filter. And filters come with some insertion loss. So in your path loss equation, you have insertion loss of the filter. And time switches don't have insertion loss. It's clicked. It's zero dB. It's zero dB. It's zero. DB. It's zero. Time um, switching is more efficient. Your phones will run cooler. Your battery life is longer. Can you see? Thank you. 
holding your breath at some point. And I made it to this before the class, because I had a chance. Just a left hand breath. It's probably in your canvas in the file. See, why would that be the 57th hit? It says OFDM graphic to do exactly what I did. <laughs> okay, hopefully you can see that. This is going to take about a day to explain. Just kidding. This is very complex. But the point is, I'm going to turn on and off my transmissions in order to shape it into those sync functions, boing, 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 we talked about. Each one of those sync functions is going to carry with it a constellation diagram. Another one. Another one. These are 16 quam in this example. But I could have 250 of these, and that's what today's LTE does. So there's a little buffer of time. We can play with that, and I'll explain why. There's a pulse of energy in time, another pulse of energy in time, and this red X is the pulse of energy in time. And those pulses, when you turn something on and off, the resultant frequency domain is a bunch of sync functions. So if I just turn on some energy and I turn it off, and the Fourier series of that is a, a sync function, sine x over x, and that's what that kind of is. So during this time slot, I'm sending you one, two, three, four, in this case, but it could be 250 constellation diagrams. And then we wait a second, less than a second. And I send you 250 more constellation diagrams. So you're writing down, these are all 101, 1000, 100, making these long digital words. Look at how much data there is flying through here. And the way to send even more is to shorten this time, and shorten it, and shorten it, and have more, 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 more. But there's a limit there. All right. So this is a way to stack users the boring way, horizontally, by frequency. But I'm not giving you 30 kilohertz. This is more like um, 15 kilohertz in LTE. 15 kilohertz, 15 kilohertz. I'm sending you data, 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 data. So these frequencies are very closely packed. In reality, there's no gaps like this. This is just drawn for ease of use. I mean, how many 15 kilohertz fit in a 10 megahertz band? That's what we're talking about, LTE and 5G. This is from Dr. Bernard Sklar. He wrote the Digital Communications book. It's referenced at the top of the slide deck. And uh, he works at the Aerospace Corporation with me. He's like 97 years old. He still teaches. And every conference call, he leaves his camera running. We're going to hit that a couple more times, OFDM, when we talk about the particular standards. But when 802.11, if you look at the history of it, it was 1 megabit per second, 2, 4, 11, and then 150 megabits per second. There was a giant leap in data throughput. That's when 802.11 started using OFDM. You can see it in its evolutionary standards. Um, yeah, it's used in all from N, I guess, and AC, and on uh, all use OFDM in those standards. And it's the greatest efficiency in bits per hertz. So we solved all the communication problems in your parents, so classes are, oh wait, there's a big problem. <laughs> Sorry, those were. Wireless routers, and it was not slow down on an old wireless router. 
this and it doesn't exist. Yeah. Like trying to remain backward compatible kind of because <laughs> before I think it was N, uh -huh. you had a virus G and then connected to a virus N and then slow down the G. Oh jeez. Yeah. To the G. But once they started using that and I think the email they stopped mm -hmm. you could do that. Yeah, that's even um LTE there was a 5G plus or a 5G um, non standalone. When it first came out, they, they actually just carved up some of the LTE and had a 5G signal in it. But because it was just some of it, it was worse throughput than just LTE. So the first instantiations of 5G were slower than LTE because they just tried to fit it inside of it as a broadcast channel. All right, so. If you just have a wideband signal and you're trying to send a bunch of data as much as you can, like in a wham 256 kind of way, you need this amazing signal noise ratio. You've got to be right next to each other, pointing at each other. But if you were to choose narrow band, just like little 15 kilohertz at a time, which is what OFDM does, you could still get just as wet, I mean, just as much data. But now you don't worry about signal noise ratio as much. Now you don't um, consume as much frequency bandwidth, which is expensive. So, um, yeah, it's a bunch of small delivery vehicles. This is what Amazon's figured out, right? It's not 18 wheelers and trains anymore. Um, so, high data rate in one truck or a bunch of little trucks carry your data for you. And this is great in case you have a frequency selective fading or something like that, one or two of those trucks have to get resent. And uh, we got some. OFDM is also called multi-carrier modulation. All those little 15 kilohertz slivers are, they're all carrying little backpacks of data. It's the number of OFDM bits times that frequency bandwidth that you have and the bit duration, that pulse time that I turn it on, is one over R of the bits per second. So if I have N parallel streams, and LTE has about 250 of them, 255 or whatever, we'll get into that. Um, so all these parallel data streams are called subcarriers, the big carrier frequency, all those little 15 kilohertz wide ones are subcarriers, and they each have a bandwidth of, I gave you 15 kilohertz as an example, and a data rate of R over N. How many streams do you have? The way to send more data now would be have the bandwidth FB even narrower and narrower. What if it was only one kilohertz? I could still send a QAM 16 signal. Or what if that time window was shortened? That's what 5G does, just to glance ahead. So, sending parallel streams of data. <clears throat> so, N is the, sorry, it's so illegible. N minus 1 is written up there. The number of streams you plan on sending, which is like 255 for LTE, though, that's that N in the bandwidth. And each one sends two bits of data. So this is the breakthrough that made this happen, is we, the communication systems world, figured out orthogonality. Normally to send like a 30 kilohertz um, CB radio kind of signal, the next channel would have to be 30 more kilohertz away because of roll-offs and things like that, this, or using orthogonality, allows you to pack those mofos with no gaps in between them all. And, uh, so how do you do that? So in the orthogonal sub subframes in the in the frequency domain, V is there. 
So this is three subcarriers. This is grossly exaggerated. These look like way different frequencies. Let's say they're just shifted by 15 kilohertz, okay? But this is um, exaggeration for emphasis. Is the time domain representation of, I'm sorry, this is time domain representation. The frequency domain representation is that sync function. And the sync is sine x over x. And anytime you have an x in the denominator, you have things go to zero. So when the red sync function is at zero, that can now be the center frequency for the dashed frequency. When the dashed frequency goes to zero, that's a good opportunity to have a center frequency right next to it. So instead of spacing it in terms of bandwidth and how much bandwidth I need, I use sync functions which cross zero a bunch of times. This red waveform is off, 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 and all those zero crossings. Because it's off, I can stick another sync function right next to it. So just kilohertz away, I can put another one. <clears throat> this is a, uh, yeah, this is regular old frequency domain. I usually pick my channel spacing due to roll off and things like that. This is what, how tightly you can pack in frequency domain on the bottom. But if you use the feature of orthogonality, you can pack those things much closer together. And the way you make a sync function is you turn on energy and you turn it off. And you square wave and time, and I've got a sync function in frequency. So of course, tight packing keeps saying the choice of that signal spacing or FB is related to the bit rate. And uh, we talked about this before, but when do frequencies shift on a communication system? What, what causes sometimes frequency shift to happen? It's an, one of the impairments we talked about for a channel. frequency shift. When, say again, Devin. Say again. When you're moving, and it was like, what? Can you elaborate? And I said, things shift when you're in a car or a plane. Exactly. And, and Devin even mentioned, but that's a small shift though, right? It's not like it goes from 700 megahertz to 600 megahertz to 800. It's 700 to plus or minus kilohertz. So it's not normally that big of a deal. But plus or minus kilohertz. Those are spaced at kilohertz. Those are only 15 kilohertz apart on the LTV. Out of 700 megahertz, that's a very small percentage <laughs> change, right? 10 to the 5 versus 10 to the 8. 1,000. <laughs> Hundredth of a percent. So now we're dealing with, I said the way to increase data rate was to pack those even tighter. I mean, why is it 15 kilohertz? Why not 5 kilohertz apart? And now you're getting to the point where if you're jogging, you can have worse performance than when you're walking. So the tighter you make those frequencies, it's not a, no free lunch. Right? If it's one hertz apart and I stand up and I walk to the door, I would have lost all the data because my frequencies shift by more than one hertz. And if I was in a car, forget it. <clears throat> but now I say that this might fall apart in the presence of Doppler distortion or frequency shifting. But uh, Starlink uses what DM? 17,000 miles an hour? That's a lot of frequency shift. How do they do that? I think we might get to that. But it's not a deal breaker, in other words. It can, you can surmount these types of problems. But that's a problem with OFDF. It doesn't handle uh, Doppler distortion. Question? Go ahead. That's not like the 
digital signal processing. We got, why do you have to spoil everything? Just kidding. No, that's very in, intuitive and insightful is I can predict frequency shifts if I know everything about the orbit of something or if I know that it's coming or going. Or maybe I have like a control channel where I'm like, hey, the control channel says it's 120 hertz lower, 119 hertz lower, 117, five. As it's going over, it's going to change, right? And um, so, yeah, there's ways of measuring, predicting, and correcting for Doppler. But you got to plan for it. And, and Starlink sure has. So this is the old, old versus new, right? No, so the first instantiation of 802.11 using OFDM or any orthogonality is 802.11n. There's 20 megahertz total but we always stick in some guard bands. You'll see that with LTE. 10 megahertz channels are really nine megahertz. We just don't want that power to bleed into some other carrier or some other cell tower. So 20 megahertz really becomes 15 megahertz usability. We gotta get those frequencies back, by the way, and future versions do. But back then, 20 megahertz, 15 usable. There's 48 subcarriers inside that. Subcarriers are those OFDM small delivery trucks, right? So you take the 15 megahertz and divide it by 48. So each subcarrier bandwidth is 312 kilohertz. The example I kept giving was 15, that's what LTE did. But 312 kilo and a half kilohertz is what's inside either the 2.4 or the 5 gigahertz bands. And, and nowadays, think about it, um, Wi-Fi can be 160 megahertz, so we'll talk about the evolution of it, but this is the first instantiation. So it goes the width of the sync functions, when the next sync function happens, it was 312 kilohertz away. And uh, it was just the magazine where it was somewhat. <clears throat> we talked about inner symbol interference before, where a bit sits on top of another bit, or the data you're trying to send sits on top of the other data. It happens with multipath, but it happens in, if you try and put frequencies too close together anyway, or data streams too, too close together. So choosing orthogonality is gonna help you so you don't get your signal stolen, something like that. The weather's too nice to keep it too long. Right? We'll just, it's a function of how nice it gets, how early we get. Um, so uh, we got a bunch of subcarriers now. We're going to talk about since they're different frequencies sending data similar time periods, time epochs, but your frequency selective fading has less of an impact on your ability to receive. Sure, that was sucked out, but was that all the data? That was some of those OFDM subcarriers won't make it through as you're mo moving mobily through a channel. So you'll have different error codes per frequency to overcome frequency selective fading. Or you might ask for, hey, you need to retransmit, not the whole data stream, just that one delivery truck, not the whole big, uh, train car, uh, container ship. So this increases block error rate goes down. This increases your ability to receive, hey, at least I got 11 twelfths of the data. And there's 48 subcarriers in the Wi-Fi. Old Wi-Fi, if you dropped a packet, you asked for that whole 20 megahertz worth of data again. Nowadays, we can have, ask just for that subcarrier data word again, retransmit that. Delay spread, blah, blah, blah. We'll talk about that. <clears throat> so 
the first um, youth, or OFDM was every one of those subcarriers had its own oscillator circuit. It was racks and racks of equipment, each with its own radio that were 312 kilohertz apart or 15 kilohertz apart. They had a radio and a radio and a radio and a radio and a radio. 48 different radios just for that Wi-Fi signal is how the first instantiation of OFDM, they're like, this is awesome. Someday it'll fit in a room. That's what they said about computers. Right? Someday you can fit a computer in a small room. But uh, so how do we shrink that down and shrink that down? And, uh, so digital signal processing, once again, I always lean on that one. So the first concept used n number of oscillators, which would have been 48 for Wi-Fi. But now we can just do n number of discrete Fourier transforms on the signal. And we just say shift by 312 and a half kilohertz and do another um, frequency translation of that. And then we get into the time domain and you see there's a phaser there, and a phaser there, and a phaser there in the time domain after each Fourier transformation. Scoot over 15 kilohertz and do it again. Scoot over 15 kilohertz and do it again. So I receive the entire signal and I just walk through it using um, Fourier transform, in inverse Fourier transform. That's a lot better than uh, an oscillator per subcarrier, which is the first example of it. Magic. <clears throat> it's all yourself. So in, in reality, all those little other pulses that you see, they will occur at the, the zero crossing of every single pulse will occur at the peak of the usable subcarriers. So there's a lot of noise down there as a result but we are now capable of closely spacing things together. All the nulls correspond to the peaks of adjacent subcarriers. Not just adjacent, but all the subcarriers out to infinity. So that, that's almost a limiter. All, <laughs> you could put all. Thank you, orthogonality. So um, a cyclic prefix, 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 cyclic it keeps happening. Um, it is the spacing between those time pulses that we have. It's wasted space, okay? There's inefficiencies in everything. The longer the gap in time between those pulses in time create those sync functions, this is like a, almost a buffer in time. <clears throat> Those words in conjunction with the pseudo random stacking? You can, yep, yep. Then um, now we have a bitstream, and that bitstream we can convolve with our code, with our PN sequence to extract just your data out of it. That's where I do it, yeah. yeah. I may have mentioned when. I was getting into communication systems. Everybody forgot about these ends, the RF frequencies, and their goal was just to put an antenna into it. <laughs> Serial to parallel data stream and pull data out like that. And they tried, and it, too much brightness, and the chips got overloaded, and I'm like, you still need RF hardware, I don't know. You still need to notch out the TV stations that are nearby, and all that. So there's still a need for us to pull in the log relics. But that was the goal, <laughs> to go straight into turn it into data as fast as you can. <laughs> the data stream. <clears throat> so residual ISI, there's still some left. I'm still going to be receiving old data streams. So the more time padding I put in there to let those die down, will help, but it's an overhead. This is an inefficiency. And uh, just to spoil where we're going, 5G will say, oh, there doesn't seem to be much multipath. This dude's clearly outside. Let's reduce that cyclic prefix way down and remove those inefficiencies. Because that's, that's time that nobody's doing anything. They're just 
waiting for multicast to add. So we have guard bands and frequency where I can't put different communication systems or different wireless systems right on top of each other. They have gotta have gaps, guard bands and frequencies. Now we have guard intervals in time to overcome those like multicast type channel impairments. Calculated double time. Oh shoot, there's difficulties with OFDM. I thought we solved all the communication systems. Problems. Peak to average power ratio is a new term where in order to send out one watt of OFDM, I need a higher peak to average ratio inside that amplifier. To send out one watt, I need to buy a damn five watt amplifier. So I have a good peak to average ratio. And a five watt amplifier is gonna kill the battery of this device in about 30 minutes instead of 16 hours. Like it's not linear <laughs> on how much that would ruin it. I need a high peak to average ratio, power ratio for this to work. So the way, and I'll, I'll do a little bit of RF engineering here. Sorry for folks online. But I'm going to draw a graph on the dry erase board of linearity of an amplifier. <clears throat> this is a total deal breaker for mobile equipment. Um, you cannot put an OFDM radio in a cell phone because of this. Isn't that terrible? So P out, P in. When you buy an amplifier, it usually looks like a triangle, pointing to the right or something. And uh, it, they're usually constant gain devices. Whatever you put it in there, I'm going to add 10 dB to it. Whatever you put in there, I'm going to add 15, whatever the gain is. So if I put in one, two, three, four, five units, <laughs> I'm going to get out a linear one, two, three, four, five times 10 units. And nobody's invented an amplifier where you could just take P in to infinity and have P out always be 10 dB more than that. There's a point where these amplifiers break down. So this is an ideal curve that goes to infinity. Oh, my son showed me uh, infinity plus infinity. He's, he's not. <laughs> so, <laughs> infinity plus 15 equals sideways 16. All right, so what happens when you reach an input power level that the amplifier just can't add 10 dB to it? It starts to flatten out. And you can't get any louder than this. This is my one watt amplifier. It's rated one watt, meaning that's where it goes horizontal. You could put in 10 watts, and it's only gonna give you out one watt. You could put in one watt, it'll give you one, because it horizontally asymptotes. So, you know, one milliwatt just gives you 10 milliwatts. 100 milliwatts gives you one watt. Sorry, uh, that was a bad example. But, so this is called compression. <clears throat> No matter how much I turn up the input knob, um, right. so P max. So I need what's called a peak to average power ratio I'm going to have a certain up and down in the P in, and I'm going to want a really loud P out coming in. See, this doesn't even touch the one watt yet. If I could peak it at one watt, gosh, I need more color. I'm sorry. I'll scoot this over just a little bit. So this is the peak at one watt, right? And the average is somewhere in here. P average. Which is more like, it's the 
it's not really linear, it's not a half a watt, but it's, it's much less than a watt. So I need a high peak to average power ratio. So the most I could do is one watt, but the average I'm going to do would be down in the 100 milliwatt. Kind of thing. So I need to buy a one watt amplifier to have a one milliwatt average OFDM rating. Oh, and then time domain, when it amplifiers, the sine wave gets louder and louder as I put in input power, and then it begins to look like a square wave when I hit that, when I hit this region, the horizontal asymptote. That's what, another reason why it's called compression. It's, it's just compressing the peak of that waveform into a square wave. And that, that's what happens in audio distortion. You keep turning it up past the colors of the high frequencies. So every subcarrier needs a very high and a very low. Power amplifiers need to amplify all amplitudes equally. They need to be in their linear region. This is a linear region here. And that gets very expensive. I mean expensive in terms of power control. Oh yeah. So the, this is the input voltage is pretty small. The output is nice. I'm going to try and put an enormously loud input signal. I can't go above 10. Let me do 10. It's much better. So, yeah, expensive amplifiers. They need to have a wide linear range in order to do this. It's even very expensive in a cell tower. You get this. You get a whole room to put your equipment in. In some cell towers, the old school ones, they have a little shack next to it full of RF hardware on trays. And when we started implementing things like this, we found the thermal limits of solder. All the parts would start to slide around on the board because they were operating so hot that the solder was not. You have to use silver loaded solder nowadays that has a much, much higher temperature. So the cost of circuit boards went through the roof. There's a thermal problem in a cell tower plugged into the wall room when you started using OFDM. That peak to average power ratio translates to a lot of heat. Heat is measured in watts. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's called input back off. I now need to buy five watt amplifiers and back them off to stay in that linear region to handle PAPR. That's also called the crest factor, just in terms of industry terms. And uh, the Starlink devices need a crest factor of 13 dB. That's 20 times. So if I wanted 100 watts, I have to buy 20 times 100 watt amplifiers. That's how Starlink is able to do some of this, because they have very expensive amplifiers. And why a Starlink transceiver won't fit in your phone. It's got to be on So yeah, this is what cell phones do to overcome that crest factor issue, is they don't use OFDM, they use single carrier FDM. So it's not orthogonal pulses that turn on and off. A cell phone uses all of its bandwidth to try and send um, the data streams that it wants to send. And it sends it again, and it sends it again. So cell phone, the handsets are very different. We don't use that. That's just for power savings. <clears throat> I figured out it's twenty-one dollars a year to charge my cell phone and my electricity bill until I bought solar. If they were OFDM, that would quintuple for sure. And uh, I think we're done. We'll talk about other issues with OFDM. OFDM A, multiple access. And uh, yeah, unless there's any, and I'll dive more into single carrier FDM next class.
or I'm sorry, next Tuesday. Zoom is tomorrow. Um, any questions online?